Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our service. Whether you're participating on Zoom or whether you're here with us in person, we are glad you're here. I'm Roger Jones, one of the ministers serving UUSS. Uh, along with me today are my colleague, the Reverend Lucy Bunch, worship associate Theo Clare, some of our singers from our choir, our music director Anthony and our pianist Irina, our technical producers Ivan and Colleen, and a lot of other people. If you'd like to follow the order of service for today, a printed copy is on the back table or on the welcome table just outside this room, and you can find it by clicking the link uh, that's in the chat. You can find it on our website uh, every Sunday, the, the printed order of service. We invite you to explore the many ways that we live out our mission as a congregation, which is we come together to deepen our lives and be a force for healing in the world. Our weekly message email comes out on Fridays, and you can find it on our website and subscribe. It has announcements and invitations and a weekly pastoral note. If you're new to UUSS, we extend a special welcome to you, and we hope that you will uh, fill out a newcomer's card so we can connect with you either at the welcome table here after the service, or you can find it at our website, uuss.org newcomers we can connect with you and provide more information. Uh, tomorrow morning, Joanne Anglin has the uh, bi-weekly poetry uh, reflection on Zoom, uh, focusing on a powerful poem by a poet from Ukraine. That's at 10. Our United Nations Association invites you to a special speaker with a professor outside here at two o'clock today. Next Sunday, we have a new monthly program, and we invite you to come early. Uh, it's called the Racial Equity Orientation, and it's led every month by members of our racial justice team. It's open to everybody who'd like to learn more. It starts in the FAS classroom over there at 9.30, the second Sunday of every month. And we're excited about this coming weekend, which is opening weekend for Theater One's production of Roe. This play will be right here on this stage, and it is an exciting dramatization of events, events surrounding the landmark Supreme Court case of Roe versus Wade, which established abortion rights in this country, which are now under attack. You can find a ticket link in the weekly events blue sheet, and you can get that on the table in the back, or you can find it on our website at the link in the chat. Row starts March 11 and it runs three weekends, Friday nights and Sunday afternoon. To learn about our youth groups and our Sunday school for younger children, please contact Miranda Massa, our coordinator for religious education programs. We invite you to join us after the service today. If you're on Zoom, please hang around after the postlude. Uh, by the magic of Zoom, you'll be divided into breakout rooms and you'll have about 12 minutes to get acquainted and to reflect on uh, the service today. And if you're here, you could visit the adult enrichment table or you can come outside for coffee, tea, lemonade, and conversation on the patio, or you can do both. Now, you can silence your cell phones, please. Uh, make sure it's on silent mode to avoid embarrassment. And if you're at home, you might turn it off or turn it, the, the, the sound off to avoid distractions so you can be more present for the service. However you are here, we are glad you're here. Next, Theo will lead us in the chalice lighting. Those of you at home on Zoom, now is a good time to get your chalice or candle ready if you'd like to light one along with our chalice lighting in the sanctuary. Please join me in this responsive reading. I'll be reading the text in bold. Please join me for the words in italics. We kindle this flame, the symbol of our shared search for truth and understanding. We light this chalice in community. In times of danger and confusion, 
May its fire bring us courage and commitment. We light this chalice in faith. In times of doubt, may its warmth renew our connections to one another and the spirit of life. We light this chalice with love. In times of change, let its light illuminate our deepest values, the values which call us forward together. We light this chalice with hope. Joined in the spirit of life and hope, Please rise in body or spirit to sing, Here We Have Gathered, 360. Here we have gathered, gathered side by side, circle of kinship, come and step inside. It is good to be together this morning. <sighs> Let us be present together in gratitude for our lives and for all that makes our lives rich and good. And let us offer support this morning to all those who have challenges and difficulties wherever they may be. We grow our resilience as we learn to live fully with both the joys and the despair, the challenges, and the opportunities. We grow in resilience when we can hold the pain of the world, but still allow ourselves to feel joy in our lives. And this community can be a source of strength and resilience. And one of the things that makes us strong is our coming together to share our celebrations and our sorrows. This morning, I have several cards of, to share with you of celebrations and sorrows, and then I'd like you to just note all the candles over there represent things that are on people's hearts that they chose to light a candle for. Let us hear these words. Alison Clare is asking for prayers for Maya uh, as she responds to difficult health news and to her spouse, Hallie, offering them both peace and ease as they navigate the days to come, and her hopes that they feel buoyed by the love of this community. Gary is expressing gratitude for the love and caring that he's received during his recent health challenge. 
One among us is asking for prayers for Shirley Darling, uh, for better health, especially healing of her eyes. And Allison again asks that we offer peace, ease, and healing to Anthony and his wife, Catherine, as he goes through health challenges. Doug this morning is remembering his brother, Peter, who died one year ago. Good friend, good brother. Gina is noting the passing of her mother in November 2021 and that her sister Patrice is going through chemo for uterine cancer. Christopher tells us that it's a beautiful day and his family is rested and happy. So may it be for all. Karen is sharing her growing connection with her grandson Carlo, who is 10 and needs lots of positive love and support. Colette is asking for prayers for the people of Ukraine and prayers for the president of Zelensky as well. Dante has both a joy and a sorrow. He's delighted he got a video game on extreme discount. <laughs> Pretty good. And at the same time, here's Dante modeling, holding the good and the challenging. He's mourning the events in the Ukraine and hoping for them to be okay and safe. Sandy is sending healing blessings to her dear friend, Tim, who's recovering from emergency surgery. Mary is sharing with us that her 95-year-old dad, Bob, has re-entered hospice, but that he is still engaging. Eli, uh, one among us, is sharing that uh, their neighbors had a fire at their house last night, but that they are physically okay. Another among us just writes, Ukraine. Let's just take a moment of prayer together, holding in our hearts all the joys and sorrows that we've heard and all those that remain unspoken. <sighs> Holy Spirit, let us know we are not alone, but held in love and support by this community and the greater community which shares our vision of a peaceful, loving, enriching, encouraging, safe, and sustainable world. Help us to hold on to the faith in the worth and goodness of all beings. Help us to hold on to our faith that love trumps hate. Blessed be. I'm feeling the inadequacy of words about how I feel about Ukraine the powerlessness that I feel, the despair that I feel. Powerlessness does not help us. While we're powerless around Ukraine, we can send money and there's a link on our website. While we're powerless about Ukraine, we're not powerless in our own lives and the things that we can do to make a difference in our lives and in our immediate world. But I wanna just, I want us all to do our embodied prayer this morning for the people of Ukraine. And I'll just walk you through it one time. You can use whatever words you wanna use when we do it in silence together. So we begin in our prayer pose. If you do this with me, I'll walk you through it. We begin with our prayer pose. We reach out and offer our gifts in whatever way we can. We reach out to the world and to the people of Ukraine, offering them our love and support and our solidarity. We reach higher still to draw on all the goodness of humanity, all the beings that can be united in caring and loving these people. We bring all that energy back down into our heart and center it in our intention. 
Let's do that together three times. You can frame it however you want or just be silent in your mind and in your speech. Let us begin. Amen. Let us take a moment now for the silent prayers of our own hearts. Blessed be. Good morning. Good morning. I don't know about you, but it's been a difficult week, more so than average, maybe. Here we are at the end of the driest two-month period in recorded Sacramento history, surrounded by headlines of war and occupation and all human suffering. 
It's times like these that I notice myself feeling somewhere between uh, despair and cynicism with no small amount of helpless rage. Don't we know better by now? Why can't we get out of these cycles of war and profit and violence? Any progress we make seems to be wiped out so easily. Civil rights stripped and, adductions and emissions reductions scrapped or ignored, and the budget for war increased time and time again. Those most ardently clinging to white supremacy and all of the profit that can be wrung from an ever more militarized society have all of the money and all of the weapons and all of the power. And really, I can fight as hard as I like, but what if the ship has already sailed? What if I can't keep the bombs from dropping and the seas from rising and the salmon from dying and the soils from growing thin and barren? Now, at this point, I, I can't actually let myself think like this or I just won't get out of bed tomorrow. I believe that a better world is possible. I have to believe that a better world is possible or I might not keep going. At the end of the day, that conviction is a choice that I make. It has less to do with a rational analysis of the situation and much more to do with faith. The faith that a better world is possible and that I might contribute to it, gives my life meaning. But these days, when I take a look at the big picture, that faith seems harder to muster up. I've been trying to start small. I plant seeds in my garden. The acorn that I planted last month for weeks and weeks seems to be doing nothing. But under the surface of the soil, its taproot was stretching down, down towards water. This week, it sent up leaves smaller and greener than I ever would have thought possible. My lupin seeds haven't germinated yet, but the mugwort that I propagated has taken very well, and I harvested my first carrots last week. My carrots were yellow and purple and white, and I fed them to my friends and I brought them to Food Not Bombs down on the corner of J and 10th, and we fed them to anyone that wanted a lunch. And I gave out food, and I gave out Narcan, and we gave out clothes and blankets, and I looked people in the eye, and I listened to whatever they wanted to tell me. There is so much I don't have control over. I like being in control. But I can fill my garden with native plants, and with vegetables, and I can feed my friends, and I can feed my community. I am trying to sow the seeds of faith so that I can harvest them again later. I hope they germinate soon. In the liturgical calendar of the Christian tradition, last Wednesday began the season of Lent. For the 40 days leading up to Easter, the calendar of Sunday New Testament readings includes many episodes from the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, and especially the parables, the engaging or perplexing stories for which Jesus is remembered. One of the readings for this time is this one, which comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come down looking for fruit on this fig tree and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should I be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down.
I'm going to invite some um, folks from the choir to come up and join us to sing our next hymn. One of my favorites, maybe my favorite, We Are Not Alone. Let's rise in body or spirit and sing together. That makes me happy. Thank you for singing that. Generosity is a spiritual practice, and we practice generosity in our congregation by giving away half of each Sunday's offering to an organization that is working to make a difference in the world. For March, our community partner is Family Promise an organization with a vision to end family homelessness. The Family Promise Program helps families get back on their feet and into stable housing and work situations. Because of the pandemic, they have been unable to house families in host churches, and so your donation is more important now than ever to keep this program going. Please give generously in support of this important organization. You can see on the slide the ways that you can donate, and it's posted in the chat as well. Thank you for your generosity. The morning's offering will now be given and received.
Please join me in the unison response to our offering. May the spirit of gratitude bless and multiply all that we have, all that we give, and all that we receive. Good morning. Good morning again to those who have logged in since I said good morning at the welcome and those who have slipped in. It's good to see some brand new folks here and some people I haven't seen for a very long time as well as people that I see every week. You heard the parable told by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke the owner of the land has an orchard or a vineyard. There is one fig tree in it that has not yielded fruit for three years. Three years, he bellows. Why am I wasting this good soil on a tree that won't produce? He orders his gardener, cut it down. But the gardener replies, sir, let's give it another chance. Leave it alone one more year. I'll loosen up some of the dirt around it and fertilize it. If it's still not bearing fruit in a year, then you can cut it down. That is the end of the parable. Jesus does not say how things turn out, like whether the tree came through with figs in a year or not. The parable doesn't even say if the owner accepted the gardener's proposal. After all, if you owned an orchard or a vineyard, what's one less fig tree if you could have another tree planted in its place? But the gardener is willing to show some patience to this one. Seven and a half years ago, I moved into my house in Sacramento. In my backyard are two mature persimmon trees, among other kinds of trees. They are fuyu persimmons, the kind with a round, squat shape that you can slice or crunch on like an apple when they get ripe. Of course, I didn't know this, didn't know which kind of persimmon they were for the first few years that I lived in my house because I never saw the persimmons get ripe enough or large enough to eat. I never saw them grow from green to orange. Rats or squirrels or both got to them first. Two years ago, however, one persimmon tree flourished. Somehow the rodents didn't ruin it. From its bounty, I ate one whole persimmon per day and had plenty to share with others. A neighbor took some home and returned the favor a few weeks later with some jars of deep orange preserves that he'd made out of them. This past year, I was looking forward to another healthy crop. Over the hot summer, I followed a practice of deep watering for all my trees, including the persimmons. Nothing happened. <laughs> I didn't even see little green fruit for the rodents to eat. So in seven years, one tree has provided only one crop of edible persimmons. The other tree has yielded nothing. Why waste the water on them? Following the vineyard owner in the parable, why not let them wither or die of thirst? Well, I am sure some of you have a ready answer to that. We need to keep all the trees we have in Sacramento for the sake of the environment. And I expect messages will be arriving in my email inbox after the service <laughs> with advice on how to help the trees do better. I will probably take the advice and the wisdom of the parable's gardener and give them another year of deep watering and probably more years after that. However, as I thought about this parable, it occurred to me that Jesus is not giving advice on gardening or farming. The story about the fig tree is probably about us. What fruit are we bearing? How are we using the days and seasons that we are given to live? By what values do we wish to act and speak 
to give and share. The parable is open, open-ended and unfinished. So is every day for us, open-ended, unfinished, uncertain. How we live each day is the demonstration of our faith. Here at UUSS, our Soul Matters theme for this month of March is renewing faith. The term faith means a lot of different things to different people. When hearing the word faith around here, it could be automatic to think of other people's faith, like a statement of belief, like a creed or a doctrine. You either believe it or you don't. So today, whether you think you have a faith or not, I'd like us all to open up and widen our sense of that word. I'd like to consider faith as our approach to life. It is the way we live our values in the world day by day. Faith is not the absence of doubt, but the demonstration of our values no matter what. As a community in the Unitarian Universalist tradition, our shared approach to the world comes from the values of our UU principles. For example, together as UUs, we are faithful to the principle of human dignity and worth, inherent worth in everyone. And we support a free and responsible search for truth and meaning and spiritual growth. Faithfully, we pursue justice equity, and liberty. By faith and commitment, we endeavor to practice democracy and promote its use in society at large. When we try to live into the sense that we are part of the web of life, when we live with an awareness that we are interdependent, we are living faithfully. To my knowledge, fig trees don't show up in any other of Jesus' parables but they do appear in other parts of the Bible, including some books of the Hebrew scriptures. The trees provide examples or metaphors to apply to our own lives and to apply to the common good. When a fig tree is full, it's a symbol of abundance and faithfulness to the call of life. When it's a withered one or a tree that isn't bearing fruit, it's a symbol of squandered opportunity. Looking at today's parable, you could say that the fruitless fig tree is not being faithful to its own possibility, is not responding to the call of life. But in the parable, we don't know if this fig tree has actually had what it needs to feel the call of life or to respond to it with branches full of fruit. All we know about is the patience of the gardener. The gardener tells the impatient vineyard owner, let's leave it alone and see. The gardener wants to show it patience, but he doesn't really intend to leave it alone. He wants to give it more attention. He will loosen the soil provide fertilizer, and water the tree as faithfully as if it were one of the flourishing trees in the vineyard. He is hoping for a turnaround, but he doesn't know. By his generous care, he shows faith in the possibility of growth, in the possibility of flourishing. In the midst of doubts or fears, in the wake of setbacks, the practice of patience can be an act of deep faith. There are so many tender places of our lives where we cannot act with certainty or sure confidence, but we can try to act with faith in our deepest commitments and our guiding values. And there are times when we have no other choice but to act in faith. We are hoping for a change, but we don't know. Sometimes I feel doubt about the values that guide me. It's not a loss of faith, but a shrinking of it. 
when my deepest commitments get clouded up with distractions. It may take some time for the clutter of my mind and my soul to clear up. And sometimes this clearing up comes from the kindness and care of others by their listening presence and their patience. And sometimes I am jarred into a renewed sense of clarity and faithfulness by the deeds of people I don't even know. Today I am thinking about the people of Ukraine as victims of an unjustified invasion by forces of the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin, they have shown courage and solidarity. The faithfulness of Ukrainian soldiers and civilians to their country has been reflected in their bold young president's faithfulness to them. Of course, when you compare their unity and their bravery to Putin's arsenal and his cruelty, it can be easy to doubt their chances of getting him to retreat. Yet from Ukraine, we hear ordinary people saying, we have no other choice. For them, resistance is an act of faith. Unarmed Ukrainians have confronted Russian, Russian soldiers. They have stood in front of armored vehicles. According to the news website, The Guardian, video footage from Ukraine shows at least one Russian tank column hurriedly reversing after being confronted by unarmed civilians. It can be a faithful action to practice solidarity with people resisting injustice. By their faith and courage, the Ukrainians have inspired volunteers from other nations to sign up to go and fight alongside them. Donors from around the world are sending money for food and other humanitarian relief. And many Russian people are protesting the war in Russia. Thousands have signed petitions against it. In reaction to that, Putin has outlawed criticism of his war, outlawing even the public use of the terms war and invasion. In any time of war, there are many accounts of cruelty and brute force. For example, in the past few weeks, police have detained more than 7,000 Russians for protesting around the country. Yet it is amazing and worth celebrating that in a country controlled by a dictator, at least 7,000 people have taken the risk to demonstrate against him. In Putin's hometown of St. Petersburg, the police detained a lady named Ludmila Vasileva. Vasileva. She's a Russian woman of 77. Ludmila said that she was a child when the Second World War was happening, and as a child, she survived the siege of St. Petersburg during that war. The siege lasted two and a half years. And Ludmila refuses to go along with a Russian assault on another country. Her witness is an act of faith. In the capital city of Moscow, the police detained two mothers and their five children for placing flowers at the gate of the Ukrainian embassy in a gesture of peace and friendship. They also held up posters against the war. Feelings of doubt and fear would be understandable, yet by their brave actions they seem to say we have no other choice. It renews my faith in human possibility to bear witness to those in danger who show their faith in basic human dignity. When we read the parable from Luke, we hear the gardener speak to the landowner, the vineyard owner in this way. If the tree bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. He doesn't say, I'll cut it down for you. He says, you can cut it down. 
It's a statement of defiance to a man who holds power over him. It's a show of resistance against an attitude of arrogance. The gardener negotiates for an extra year for the tree, but even if it does not bear fruit in a year, he will decline to be the one to destroy a living tree. He will keep faith with its right to exist just as it is. In a challenging situation with what very little influence the gardener has, he endeavors to stay faithful to his values. In these challenging times, let us consider faith not as certainty, but as a choice, as a practice. Faith is not the absence of doubt, but the demonstration of the values that endure for us in the face of our doubts. Even in the face of heartbreak or danger, how we live each day is a demonstration of our faith. Hard things happen in our lives and in our world. As fragile human beings, we can be sure only that we have this day and we can greet it with gratitude and we can live it with courage and we can try to be faithful to the call of life. Let us greet each day asking to stay true to ourselves and true to one another. Let us ask to be faithful to the values which ground us and guide us. So may it be, blessed be and amen. As we grow in our steadfastness of faith, let us lift our voices to declare that life calls us on.
Now we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. I invite you to reach out to one another. Those at home, reach out to us. People here reaching out to you, reach out to the world. May you depart in peace. May you return in joy. For all who see God, may God go with you. For all who embrace life, may life return your affection. And for all who seek a right path, may a way be found. And the courage and faith to take it step by step, moment by moment, one day at a time. Blessed be. Namaste.